I'm Ty Hernandez. And I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. The recession hits home. How one Brooklyn parish is trying to help. Every time you, you give somebody a bag, Jesus said that you're feeding his, one of his, his, his children. The director of One Food Pantry offers his perspective. We're seeing about 40 to 42% of our folks um, previously have been working full time. And a cancer survivor pays it forward as this week's Salt of the Earth. Explaining to the patient what we went through, our experience, and hopefully they gain some strength, some comfort, less anxiety as they go through the process. Good evening. More people are showing up, but there's less to give. We're talking about food pantries. A recent study shows more than half of families with children in New York City have trouble affording food. In these tough times, local food banks are seeing more need and more people. We recently visited a pantry at one Brooklyn parish to see how it's fulfilling its mission. You need the patience of Job and the wisdom of Solomon. In East Flatbush at Holy Cross Church, it's Tuesday, and the workday is just starting. My name is Faye Buchanan. I'm the food coordinator here for the food pantry, and I volunteer two days a week, except when I have a delivery. I may be here four or five days for the week. My calling is to help these people. I see them coming here. Some of them, Lord knows, they need. And you pray to God that there is a solution. The church has a food pantry available to its parishioners. The volunteers come twice a week to distribute groceries to families that are in need. The food pantry relies on community collections as well as individual donations of food. The donations are not the same. The fundings are not the same. Everything's been cut. But somehow I try to manage these funds and order what I think is <coughs> nutritional. We have to order fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, how many we got in there? How about 20 so far? By 2 p.m., the line at the front door snakes around the side of the building. Some have been waiting for almost an hour. The first person is called in to present proof of ID and address to collect a ticket for a bag of food waiting in the basement. Hello, Mr. Key, how are you? They're allowed one visit for each month and receive a bag that will have approximately nine meals. Every time you, you give somebody a bag, Jesus said that you're feeding his, one of his, his, his children. Beside the food, you could give them a little wording also, you know, to tell them how to live, how to have courage, how to have faith, you know, try to go to church, go to confession, you know, and seek the Lord more that when you're in need and when you depend on Jesus, Him will come, thing, He will provide for us. It's good to, to, to help others. We, there's a need in this neighborhood for it, so we need to do it. And as a parishioner, I think I should give back a little. Thank you. Have a good day. What can you learn for those who volunteer? You learn how to help people, and that's what he does. That's what you can learn, how to help others before you help yourself. You know, and then he will help you. You know, put, put others ahead of yourself. We've always you. known, growing up, the Lord provides. And my parents, thanks to them, they brought us up as religious as they could. We went to parochial schools. And they always made us feel try to help somebody, no matter what. It's supposed to be God's word that ways to help people, people in need. That's what we do here when you're one of God's people. You know, you gotta play the part and do the part. You know? At the end of the day when I go home, I said, thank you, Jesus. You dragged me through this day. I dragged myself through this day with your help. And I was able to help some people I was not able to help everybody, but somehow it was good. It was good. The Holy Cross Church Food Pantry will have more later. For a closer look at how the economy is affecting Brooklyn, we talked to the director of one of the biggest food pantries in the borough, and we'll have that conversation later. Just ahead, the day's headlines, so stay with us.
Welcome back to Friday's edition of Currents. Turning to today's headlines, the H1N1 virus, which caused four school closing in the Brooklyn Diocese, has claimed the life of an 11-year-old girl. The city says the girl was a sixth grader at the Urban Assembly School of Justice in Borough Park. The teachers' union president says the student had a pre-existing condition. Donations to U.S. charities fell last year for the first time in more than 20 years. Giving USA says in its annual report that gifts to charities fell 2% in 2008, while donations to churches and religious organizations actually increased by 5.5%. New Orleans has a new archbishop, and for the first time, it's a native son. Pope Benedict named Gregory Amond, currently Bishop of Austin, Texas, to head the Archdiocese of New Orleans. The city also accomplished another first. It now has four archbishops who are still living, and one of them, Archbishop Philip Hannon, ordained Amon to the priesthood. And Pope Benedict celebrated the Feast of Corpus Christi at the Vatican on Thursday. In his homily, the Pope said that Catholics shouldn't take their faith for granted and warned them not to be influenced by secularization. After Mass, he led the Corpus Christi procession through the streets of Rome. And here is some of that procession from Rome Reports. Corpus Christi Thursday in Rome. And while the Pope celebrated the feast yesterday, dioceses in the U.S. will be observing it on Sunday. Next week, we'll show you how one parish in Queens marks the event each year. Coming up, helping in hard times, the view from the director of One Food Pantry. Also, after surviving a serious illness, how one man is trying to give something back, one patient at a time. These poor people were subject to the same problem that I was. And how could I make their journey better? Earlier we saw the challenges facing volunteers trying to help people at a parish food pantry. I recently had the chance to sit down for a conversation with the head of St. John's Bread of Life, a food pantry founded in 1982 in Bedford-Stuyvesant. I spoke with its director, Anthony Butler. Well, Mr. Butler, it's very good to have you on our program. Oh, it's my pleasure. I wanted to ask you, we all know that these are hard times. Mm -hmm. What have you seen on a daily basis? We have seen, uh, I was just comparing the stats uh, from January, um, through May of this year versus 2008. And we've seen in our uh, uh, food service delivery a 26% increase in the amount of folks we're seeing, putting us on a target to do approximately 400,000 meals this year. And our social service component, we're seeing a 16 to 25% uh, increase. And you say also the difference is not just the homeless anymore. Right. You're seeing people working. Very much so. We have, uh, we're running uh, probably in our demographics about 22% of our folks are undomiciled or homeless or very marginally housed. We're seeing about 40 to 42% of our folks um, previously have been working full time. Maybe not one job, it may have been two or three jobs kind of put together. Um, that is our largest growing group and seniors, people on fixed incomes. We should talk a little bit about what you yeah. do specifically. Mm -hmm. Bread right, and yes. Life is the program, is yeah. the not-for-profit organization yes. that you represent. Yes. Uh, Bread and Life is one of the largest emergency food providers in the city and the largest in Brooklyn. Uh, as I mentioned, we were on target to do 400,000 meals. Um, and we don't just provide meals, we provide social services. Last year um, alone, we were able to uh, help uh, individuals procure over $800,000 in, benefit, 800, in benefits. Uh, this year, we did a free tax program for folks that... Uh, help them uh, uh, return over $3 million um, of benefits, uh, earned income tax benefits and school tax credit benefits that they probably wouldn't have received. So um, we're a community-based model um, and very, very much our, our mission is to work to assist people so they don't need us. 
to, to break that cycle of poverty or at least begin breaking it and respond in a charitable um, manner when times are tough. This is an organization that began by doing something as simple as serving meals. Now yes. you're something of a, yeah. an expert on the field. Yeah. You actually have a computerized method yes. of delivering food, yes. of, of allowing people to order mm -hmm. food. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about that? Um, moved, it's interesting, the place was first founded in 1982, was giving sandwiches out after mass. And we've recently, as of uh, last June, we've instituted and created the first digital food pantry. Um, and what that allows people to do is they're awarded a certain number of points based on their family size um, and given a swipe card. And they swipe this card at a terminal um, and up pops the various food groups and they will hit, for example, grains and it will show pasta or rice and they'll place that order in and it's worth a certain amount of points that are deducted from their monthly total. Um, we did this for two reasons. One, technology is the normative way we do stuff. It should not be something that people of a certain socioeconomic group can use and the poor can't. It's the normative way of doing things. Um, it's a much more dignified. Most of us order our stuff on the web. Um, I just did my driver's license over the, <laughs> over the right. web. Very um, convenient as yes, well. Yes, very convenient. And the other thing we're finding is when we're giving people choices, we used to give them prepackaged bags that had 14 items in them. Um, now we allow them to choose and people are taking on an average eight items or less when we give them the choice. So there's nothing wasted or no. there's less wasted. It's in a this much process. less waste which has allowed us to respond to the significant increase um, without this the, without kind of the parallel increase in cost. This also mm. must be very useful in terms of maintaining statistics and mm -hmm. as you said right. knowing what your needs will be yes. in the coming year or yes. the coming month. Does the city use your statistics, yes. ask you for them? They, they, we uh, report our statistics monthly. We also um, work with the Food Bank of New York, or we're in the process working with the United Way and with the state in terms of ways this could be rolled out. Because one of the things that we want to do is be the most efficient and to be able to serve people the best. And you can't serve folks if you don't know what you're doing. And this allows us to, to reconfigure staffing patterns, um, to redeploy resources, because part of our, my mission, particularly as the executive director, um, and is that we're funded primarily by donations, is I have to be the best steward of the money that's given to us. And th this information allows me to do that. Everybody wants to give and to help. Mm, this right. is certainly a basic yeah. human need, yeah. the need to mm -hmm. eat. Right. How can people best help? You know, when I give a can of yeah. food, is that really as helpful as a, as a, as a finan money donation? No, actually not, um, because I can buy food cheaper than you can at Key Food or Trader Joe's so or something like that. So give the 99 cents instead of buying yes, the 99 cents. Um, yes, because I purchase at discounted rates. Um, we, um, we need volunteers. Um, we uh, significantly rely on them. We need uh, monetary donations. We're only 11% government funded. The rest of the money comes um, from individual and uh, foundation donations. We um, do many events. We are actually on the uh, 24th of this month having a fundraiser at Grand Central Terminal um, from 5 to 8. Um, if people would be interested in coming, please check it out on our website. People can buy food buy prepared food. by some great restaurants yes, all great over New York City. Yes, great restaurants. is doing it. Uh, Balvini's providing uh, drinks. Um, uh, we were hoping to have some surprise celebrity chefs there. And uh, the money goes to, obviously. Um, and the, uh, the uh, goes to Bread and Life. The event's completely underwritten, so all donations will go directly to the folks who they're intended to go to. Some people are skeptical when mm. they hear a religious institution mm. providing uh, something, right. even as basic as yeah. food. How do you respond to that? Um, I respond, um, one of the things I've learned during doing emergency food, um, we've, emergency food's all come out of faith-based. It's all been um, um, collecting food in various church bases and giving it out. Um, and it's kind of broken down into two sort of uh, camps. There's the one camp of a more evangelical, that getting food is a... Uh, um, kind of recruiting tool and a way you save souls. We do not operate. Um, as a Catholic organization, um, and particularly following the charism of St. Uh, Vincent de Paul, we see this, I, I, I say it as, I'm not trying to save anyone, anyone else's soul but my own. Um, and what we do is we take, I always say this, our obligation is to take that goodness and that religious goodness and to show it to other folks and, and respect them. And our mission statement, we, um, our mission statement says that we encounter the face of Christ in the poor. So if I'm encountering absolute goodness in what I do, then I have to, I have to kind of act that way. But for someone coming yeah. through your door, do they necessarily know it is a Catholic institution? Is there any requirement there's for coming no through your door? There's no requirements. Um, uh, the, uh, the bread and life might do. The St. John's piece, our, our logo, um, has, it's a wheat cross, so that might, but there's no requirements. Um, there's, uh, it's interesting, generally, though every meal someone volunteers to stand up and say grace. We do have a chapel on site because we recognize that one of the services people need is a quiet place to get away. It's not a chapel uh, for mass or really for services, but it's a meditative space 
um, for people to get away. We do work um, around uh, spiritual needs because we have a lot of uh, folks who've had grieving issues, who've had death issues, mm. um, lost loved ones and need assistance And you with provide that. many social services yeah, as a well. A tremendous amount of social Anthony services. Anthony Butler, I want to thank you very yeah. much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Anthony Butler there from St. John's Bread and Life. And for more information, head on over to their website. It's breadandlife.org. There is much more ahead here on Currents, so stay with us. Finally tonight, you're about to meet a cancer survivor who is paying it forward to others. Like so many people, his diagnosis came unexpectedly, but he survived it and now he's helping others deal with this disease. That's why we've chosen him as this week's Salt of the Earth. My name is Bart Frazita. Uh, I'm a Catholic by tradition, spent 16 years in the Catholic education system. I had an athletic scholarship at St. John's as well as meeting my wife at St. John's. She was my college sweetheart. We've been married 46 years. We have two daughters. They're married to their first husbands and they've given us seven grandchildren. Spent 40 years in my employment life in the insurance and reinsurance industry. Been the CFO of major reinsurance companies and in January of 1999 decided to reduce my work schedule, being the CEO of a U.S. operation of an international consulting firm. The idea was to work five years and then retire. But his plans were interrupted. And lo and behold, in December of 1999, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. Went through chemo radiation, which was 24 hours a day, five days a week for six straight weeks, and radiation during the same time. Literally every plan that you had, every thought process of what you're going to do in the next five years gets cut in half that you, knew you may not be here. So I felt if I brought a spiritually sound person to the experience, if God was on my side, if God sat on my shoulder and we went through this together, that that would help me through it. It would be easy for me to write a check and say thank you for what Sloan Kettering have done for me. But in reality, I wanted to do something, wanted to give something back. I felt that there was so much anxiety in preparing for surgery that the best place for me to be would be prior to that, meeting patients as they were learning about the cancer. And we worked out a plan where I would be part of the initial team that would talk to a new patient coming with this cancer. The thought was these poor people were subject to the same problem that I was. And how could I make their journey better? How he did that was through a remarkable and innovative program called Patient to Patient. Patient to Patient program is a program here at Sloan that focuses on volunteers coming back to walk the journey with patients who have been through the disease that they went through. And there are probably about 50 or 60 people now participating in that program. The Patient to Patient program really deals with the body and it's really explaining to the patient what we went through, our experience, and hopefully they gain some strength, some comfort, less anxiety as they go through the process. The potential of not being here tomorrow still sits in the back of my mind, and it is still there. Uh, I still take CAT scans, now it's every two years, and that time period, a week or so before that scheduled event, your mind says, what happens if there's a recurrence? What happens if they find something? How will that change me? What will I do? Where's my focus? Where's my direction? And I take solace in knowing that uh, my prayer life is good and whatever God's plan for me, well, that's what we'll live with. It's not an end, it's a journey. And, and you're going from point A to point B, but it's not to say that you can go on whether here or after. It's, it's a continuation. It's not an ending. And it's hard to get that to a patient who doesn't have God as part of his life. And if he has God or a lot of patients will turn to God because they don't know where else to turn. But if you, you've been part of that process all your life, it's, it's you're not turning to him, you're, you're asking, all right, where do we go from here? And leave it in his hands. 
Bart Frazita there, our salt of the earth for this week, and uh, such a, a strong man now passing that strength on to others. It takes support groups to a whole new level. Imagine hearing from someone not only who went through the same experience, but lives to tell about it. And he certainly looks healthy and vibrant, and that must really be an inspiration to so many people. Absolutely, and I can't help but notice a resemblance between actually him and you know uh, someone who uh, w actually passed away recently from cancer in my own life. And knowing what that struggle is, you, you know, it just really helps to hear from someone who's been through it and uh, who has survived it on the other side. And I, I just can't imagine the, uh, the inspiration that he must be. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, coming up Monday, the powerful and unforgettable testimony of Holocaust survivor Michael Preisler. That's all for this edition of Currents. And remember, you can always watch us online at netny.net. And we also want to hear from you, so drop us a line. Email us at dropusaline at currentsny.net. Thanks for watching. I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Ty Hernandez. Have a great one.